Well, hello everyone, and here we are booting up our Windows 95 PC, so that, we, that way we can take a look at Amber Journeys Beyond. Now, Amber's Journeys Beyond is a 1996 point-and-click horror-themed adventure game. It was originally developed by what I think is the husband and wife team of Frank and Susan Wimmer, uh, who would be Hugh Force Entertainment. Uh, originally, they would publish the game, but then over the years, a couple of different companies would also become responsible for the publishing, such as Certain Software and Changeling Software. Now, the game kind of really just jumps right into it, so I'm going to be quiet here while we enjoy this narration of this email that our main character is getting. Hi, it's me again. I'm going to ask a favor of you in a minute, but I figured I'd better explain why before I do the actual asking. In a nutshell, Roxy's up to her old tricks again. As you know, we've been developing a technology for tracking paranormal activity. Although I haven't been able to tell you much about our new product line, let's just say that the latest stuff goes beyond tracking. Way beyond. We've got some equipment up and running, and I've worked with Roxy for long enough to know she'd want to do the early tests herself. Normally, that wouldn't bother me. It's just that the stakes are so high this time. She's up at that old house she bought, which, as you may have heard, is reputed to be extremely active. She's treating that house like a lab. She has it totally wired with all of our latest equipment, and although we'd never tell Roxy this, we're afraid she's getting in a little over her head. Some of that equipment is still in the form of early prototypes. Fragmentation is a real problem area. I made her promise she wouldn't do anything hasty without one of us around, but... You know Roxy. So, here's a favor. Would you mind driving up there and checking up on her? We're asking you because I know that you and Roxy work together on that dream research. She respects your work, so I think she'd probably listen to you. Thanks in advance. And one final favor, be really cautious here. It's easy to catch Roxy's enthusiasm. Don't let her talk you into doing anything stupid. Regards, Jeff. All right, so here we go. We got our opening uh, video. I, I want to say FMV. I guess they are, but, um, you know, this is all computer generated. This isn't live action or actors yet. So, as I said, this is a point and click uh, horror themed game, and it does kind of just dump you right into it. So, I do want to kind of tell you bits and more about it, but at the same point, I don't want to detract from what's happening here. So, we're currently driving up to the house, the haunted house that Roxy bought. And we're about to get our first glimpse that something probably isn't quite right. And right into the pond. And there we go. There's our title screen. Amber Journeys Beyond. Yep, a Hugh Forest production. And there's who we have to thank for our modeling. And our sound effects. Alright, so what we have here is an adventure game. We kind of just get dropped right into it, and we got to explore this place. And solve different puzzles as we try to find out what happened to Roxy. Alright, there we go. So, as you can see here, it's kind of, sort of, in widescreen. But it has those big black bars at the bottom and the top. I may edit around those. I'm not positive yet. I'll have to do that in post. But, we will collect a handful of items in the game, and they will be across the bottom there. But I don't think seeing that is going to be as important as what we see in our main window here. So, we crashed. And now we kind of just move our mouse around, and our cursor will change depending on what we can do. And if I go to the very top, we get our options. Now, I believe the options are just what I want them to be. Uh, as always, save smart, save often. Well, 
Now, the cursor will change when we can do things. So depending on where I move the cursor on the screen, it will turn into sort of an arrow pointing down. If we click, well, we move. Now we have a new uh, view. So if the cursor turns in that kind of diamond, that means we can move in that direction. If the cursor uh, changes into those arrows, we can turn in that direction. Now I'm purposefully going to avoid looking at the pond. And we're just going to kind of walk back towards that road. Now we could follow the road back up to the house. Or we could follow the road back where we came. And just, you know what? Just wipe our hands of this whole ordeal and just get going. Now, there's a little sign here. It turns to a question mark. If it turns to a question mark, that means usually we can examine it or do something with it. And we find out this is the road to nowhere. And our only options are to hit the mouse button and go back to this screen. So if we just keep going forward, well, those mountains, they don't, they don't look like they're getting any closer now, do they? Our only option is going to be to turn around and go back the way we came. In fact, we should see the sign again. Yep. Now, I don't know if this is supposed to be representative of maybe the spirits here uh, preventing us from leaving or if maybe it was just a fun way for the programmers to keep us in the game. But we're going to start heading back towards the house. And we can actually see it from up here. And this is, I think, part of the fun of the game, is you know examining the environment from different angles and seeing what's there. In fact, from here we can see our car. We can really take a look at it out on the water. Well, if that's as far as a car is gone, it's probably not that deep. But we are going to keep walking towards the house. And here we are in front of the garage. We can examine the garage. We're going to leave it alone for the moment. Well, let's take a look at the mailbox over here. Well, sure enough, there is a package. Now, it's a little hard to make out, but it's got the address here. It looks like it's in North Carolina. Yep, Dr. Roxanne Westbridge, 16 Southgate Drive, Samaria, North Carolina. And what do we have in this box. We got a note. Hi Roxy, enclose this new oscillator you asked for. We've adjusted the input per your instructions. The folks in the lab thought it was an interesting idea to range up, to up the range a bit while we were <clears throat> to up the range a bit while they were at it. You'll have to let us know how it works out. Anyway, it should fit right into the unit just like the last one. If you have any problems with it, give me a call. Hell, call me after your first trial no matter what. I'm dying to know how it goes. Regards, Joe. Well, Joe may have been encouraging Roxy a little more than he lets on. And there's that little oscillator. At least I think that's what it's called. So there it is down there at the bottom of the screen. And we can click on it, and then we can use it in the environment. Right now we don't have anywhere to use it. So we're just going to put the empty package back in the mailbox. And let's just try the front door. All right. So we're inside. The, pace, the place is pitch black. Some of it has a very, very creepy feel to it because of how dark it is. And we can sort of hear something, like a rumbling almost. Now, because it's pitch black, we can't do anything in here. Can't do anything in here either. In fact, it's so dark, we can't even see our hands in front of our face. But we can see something in the corner of the room. Looks maybe like a giant server or something. Let's 
Well, where we want to go is upstairs. We want to head towards the light. And there's a lot of very peculiar looking artwork around here. We don't necessarily get to uh, interact with all of it. Can't get into that door. We can open this door. But it's a bit too dark for us in here. You can kind of make out maybe a toilet handle. There's this door that leads out onto the balcony. To the best of my knowledge, there isn't much to do on the balcony. But it is one of those things that's kind of just, you know, interesting to see the different angles of this place. What we do have is this room here. And that red light leads us to this switch. We flip it, and the power is restored. Now we can start exploring this place in earnest. Alright, so Roxy's got all kinds of computer equipment over here. And it looks like a little cassette tape. This little videotape we're going to want. We can get a nice look at this really nicely rendered mouse. This photograph of trees, what looks like maybe a little raven. All right. Croaked at live. Or no, croaked at line 1548. All right, so we can't get into our computer. We don't have the password yet. Well, technically, I know the password. We're going to figure out the password later in the game. If we were to put the password in at this point, the computer would boot up, but there would be nothing we can do with it because we haven't gotten far enough into the game yet. Let's keep looking around this room a bit. Miskatonic University. Now there's a, there's a there's a reference. All right, pardon me. She's got a doctorate of philosophy and psychology. Yeah, she uh she likes the weird paintings. These are some pictures. I'm going to assume that these are actually pictures that uh, the developers took. I just wanted to plug into their, their game for the fun of it. Call Gary about the car. Yeah, we may have to call Gary about our car. BNC Construction and AAA Electronic Services. Now, I re do remember going through this game a couple of times thinking I may have to call people. But that, thankfully, does not end up being the case. All right, she's got one of those all-seeing eyes, but it's also a magic eight ball. My reply is no. All right, is this going to be a good let's play magic eyeball? As I see it, yes. All right, I'm, t I'm taking your taking your word for that. Okay, let's check her drawers out. Nothing in that one. But here we have the Bar Draft User's Manual. All right. This is the wrong photo. You should use the latest. This looks pixely. Please clean up. So not only is it the manual, but it's also Roxy giving notes on it. Paul, overall, this looks pretty good. Note my changes in red. We need to go to print by next Thursday. Can I see another proof on Tuesday? Roxy. Those two E's should be lowercase. So it's not a very long manual here, but we're going to need it. Alright, should, should I be taking some notes here? Maybe. Alright, congratulations on the purchase of your BioSci Technologies Bar device. Just Bar doesn't need device after it. Your new Bar, what is it? 
Buick Activity Reader provides you with auto-linking to BT video cams and monitoring remote sites. Settings for level gain and frequent modulation. This manual will describe each feature in detail as well as offer some tried and true tips on how to get the best results. BioSci Technologies. We put the Psi in science. For best results, read each section in the order prescribed or <laughs> order presented and follow the settings as described. If you have problems obtaining a reading, please perform the following steps before calling customer service. Make sure your bar device is turned on. Make sure the settings are right for your environment. Check that your bar is set to run rather than set. If after these steps you are still unable to get a reading, feel free to contact our BT hotline, the number on your reg card. Your success with the bar will be determined by a number of factors, but by far the most important are the settings you use to fine tune the bar for your environment. This section will describe the settings in detail and thus make a recommendation on the numeric value you should enter as you begin your experiment. Please note, some combinations of settings will cause the bar to display ERR. If this happens, enter a different value generally resolves the error. To help you on a specific wavelength of electromagnetic energy, you may adjust the level setting on your bar device. A low level setting causes the bar device to register activity from all sources, including living beings. A low setting would therefore be appropriate for uncongested areas with very weak signal. Conversely, a higher setting will screen out interference from living animals and focus the bar on stronger signals. Our lab suggests a value is preferable for level, and a level 6 is given the most reliable results in our test environment, so I'm going to note that down real quick. I got a little notepad open here. So we're going to set level 6, and we're going to get back into the game. Gain. Once you have narrowed the range of electromagnetic energy through the level settings, adjust the relative strength of the individual signal by adjusting the gain. And a little note up there from Roxy is this, there are too many hyphens on this page. This setting enables you to amplify the electromagnetic energy which is being read. Gain is a very powerful feature and should be used with discretion. If the gain is too high, you risk interference from common appliances, which can mimic paranormal activity in a power surge. However, if you set the gain too low, you might eliminate the signals you are wishing to detect. Another factor in isolating activity is the frequency modulation of the electromagnetic signal. Typically, humans and other living animals have a short cycle on their wavelength, while paranormal activity has been associated with a long cycle. Therefore, the frequency mod setting allows you to screen out all wavelengths that belong to living creatures. To accomplish this, you must set the frequency mod to a sufficiently high enough to screen out all living entities in the surrounding area. We have determined that a frequency mod setting of 8 is sufficient to screen out all living beings and provide a clear, strong signal. So again, I will be writing that down. We want a frequency mod of 8 but we do not have a gain yet. Once you have adjusted the settings of your bar device, or just bar, simply change the top switch to run to begin monitoring activity. The bar device works alone to register paranormal activity, but also works as an ideal partner to the new handheld PK unit which serves as a remote monitoring device for the bar and other BT devices. The BT video monitor, which responds to bar activity and the AMBER unit, a new, an exciting new device, which will be released soon from Bi BioSci Technologies. The bar device can be read easily through the top panel display area. To begin reading activity at your site, switch the bar control button to run. If all of your set parameters are within correct range, you will soon see a straight line emanating from the stylus onto the LCD panel. If there is psionic activity at your site, it will be registered on the LCD display. A paranormal presence increases. The display will depict increased 
amplitude and psionic wavelengths. For the researcher attempting to monitor a large area, such as a large building, biotechnologies recommend a combination of bar device and BT video monitors. Linking our many technologies together is a new BT Peak, a small handheld unit which automatically detects all BT equipment currently online and displays results within a two mile radius. There has never been an easier, more effective way to explore the paranormal than with BT products. All right. Well, I guess Emmy's going to send you a copy for this page. Call if you don't get it by Friday. Add a photograph of the headgear. All right. So that was important because we are going to get both a bar and a peak. In fact, if we go up these spiral stairs, there's a little something right here. And there it is. It's our peak device. All right, play tonal residue. Open the door. Oh, well that sounded like somebody pleading and then getting very, very angry. Now the bar is offline, so the BT cams aren't available and the Amber unit is incomplete, so it's unable to register. Now that little peak uh, device will respond when things are happening. In fact, if we look up here, there's one of those cameras. In fact, now that we got the power on and we start looking around the house, we're going to notice those little cameras around here. So that's it for this room. Now there's more that we could do up here, but we're actually going to head downstairs. So if we go here in the living room, on the table is a phone. Maybe we should try calling for help. We're sorry, your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please check the number and dial again, or call your operator to help. So yeah, a little creepy. All right, realms of the paranormal. Okay, uh, this might be long, so bear with me. All right, introduction. Upon first glance at this volume, you may wonder why this great planet needs another book on the topic of the supernatural. Certainly there's no lack of comp compilations on this topic. However, this decade, few empirical, validated theories have existed in this field. The poor reputation of paranormal research was, in part, the result of unwise and uneducated theories of paranormal existence. The growing respect for paranormal research will certainly find its way in the general public in the hopefully not too distant future. It is the hope of this offer that this book will hasten this occurrence. Breakthroughs in atomic measurement techniques have led to two major theories which support the presence of spirits. The first, essential force theory, po posits that spirits are electromagnetic in nature and are therefore trackable via modern technology. The second, stone tape theory, uses anthropology to open gateways to the past. While neither of these theories have been validated, it is my opinion that both theories will emerge as verifiable results verifiable truths in the future. In the interim, these theories are explained in detail with the hope that a field researcher may find new approach for his or her research. Other chapters in this volume contain information gleaned through personal experience with the paranormal. After investigating over 200 reporting sightings, I have developed strong opinions regarding what ghosts are and how they live, and have speculated how our Earth appears to them. These ideas are stated in chapters 3 through 5 and are offered for your consideration. I spent my career chasing ghosts and wish to close this introduction with some advice for the beginner. Keep your mind open. Try everything and be on guard at all times. The paranormal field is exciting precisely because we do not know what is out there and there are risks in exploring the answers. So that's probably an important thing right there. Keep your mind open, try everything, and be on guard. 
All right. Now, I don't remember if this is actually 79 pages long. It seems like it, though. I don't know if I want to read through all of this, though. Let's just take a quick... No, it jumps around a bit. So let's try to read this whole thing. Essential Force. Within the last decade, scientists have come closer than ever to determine the presence of spirits. This is largely due to the Essential Force Theory, which posits that life on our planet is driven by a common, essential, or psionic force. The concept that spirits are electromagnetic is not new, but the essential force theory asks important new questions. If spirits are electromagnetic and can be read by mag magnetic meters, magnetometers, can their current ma electromagnetic current can be manipulated in any way? And perhaps more to the point, can a predictable magnetic formula be developed which, could, which would locate the presence of a spiritual plane? The answer to this question is vital to unraveling, unraveling the mysteries of the afterlife. For certainly, once we have identified the various electromagnetic components of the essential force, we may then be able to project our own consciousness into the spirit realm. So far, research has shown that there is evidence of electromagnetic residue at the sites of documented hauntings, and that this psionic force develops into waves of intensity just prior to a paranormal event. Pope and Pope 1982, first captured this evidence while exploring a haunting in the mountains of North Carolina. That's where we are. A female family member at the house in question referred to a spirit known as Margaret, who would collect and hide hair ornaments. Pope and Pope installed a, um, <laughs> installed a magnetometer in the house and brought female subjects, all wearing ladies' barrettes in their hair, into the house. After a brief waiting period, a large fluctuation in the magnetometer occurred. Within minutes, the hair ornaments started levitating out of the subject's hair and across the room. These items actually dematerialized on contact with the wall of the house to be found later in the refrigerator. The first capture of the psionic wave that exists just prior to extreme paranormal activity. Alright, the stone tape theory. Create an image in your mind of ancient potters sitting at their wheel. The clay is spinning. The potter is using his or her hands to coax the spinning clay into the shape of a plate, a bowl, a jug. The potter is talking animatedly with another individual standing nearby. A dog is barking somewhere in the distance. Now, move to the future, to a laboratory where scientists are analyzing the bowl, the bowl thrown by the potter. Scientists are attaching the device to the bowl, just as a record player translated depressions on vinyl into music. Scientists are converting information on the grooves and depressions of that pottery into audio, auditory signals. If certain conditions were met when the pottery was created, the scientists can recapture sounds of the barking dog and even words spoken by the potter. The simplified description of stone tape theory which hypothesized that sound from the past can be read from objects which captured those sounds at the point of origin. The stone tape's theory also states that sound information may not result from the creation of the object, but from the presence of certain geomagnetic events in conduction with psychic trauma. It has been observed that sites experiencing sound hauntings contain objects which were present at the time the spirit in question was alive. Promising research in the area of electromagnetic encryption, Westbridge, 1987, 91, and 92, suggests that it is possible to develop a reliable stone tape reader. In the absence of a device today, we are left to witness stone tape phenomena in action via sounds, which are carried on waves of available sounds. I experienced this in a mansion in Louisiana. Whenever my partner turned on her blow dryer, we could hear a faint music box all right, so what they were just talking about, the ghost tape, uh, the stone tape theory, was what we were able to do with our peak. We were able to hear sounds of something that happened in the past. And we'll uh, talk about that a little more in a minute. One of the biggest debates in the paranormal community surrounding, surrounds the question of why some spirits remain on Earth. 
Many scientists argue that haunting spirits suffer from at least some form of amnesia, which blocks the spirits from facing the truth of their own deaths. In this scenario, the spirits cannot remember who they are, where they are, or why they are restrained to a limited location. Stuck in a state of confusion, these spirits are unaware of their state and cannot move on to the next level of existence, and therefore haunt a location looking for clues to help them to discover their identities or resolve any unfinished issues. If this speculation is correct, it would add credence to the work of psychics employed to clear houses. In these, case, in these cases, the psychics essentially assist the spirits in understanding its predicament and alleviating the ambiguity and confusion of the environment, thus allowing the spirit to proceed into the beyond. It should be noted that some researchers believe that poltergeists are essentially... <clears throat> are essentially... Ooh, man, I'm having trouble with that word amnesic spirits that have become frustrated with their mental state. In their frustration, these spirits move furniture or other objects, inadvertently harming living people who are in the object's path. Many researchers believe that these poltergeist acts are not meant to be a threat to the living. However, this belief has not been tested in the field environment and should not be depended on to provide safety. In fact, these spirits are angry and frustrated, and would be foolhardy to believe one is safe just because a particular flying object misses one head. The amnesiatic theory is still the subject of much debate. While it seems the most plausible solution to understanding why spirits want the Earth until... Alright. So that's kind of a clue as to what we're going to be doing during the course of this game. We're going to be taking on the role of a psychic that is going to help the spirits move on. Alright. I'll get a little drink here. Where ghosts live. Much research has been devoted to understanding why spirits are often linked to a particular room or area of a property. In case after case, spirits seem to haunt a specific site and are rarely witnessed outside that specific location. This is an area of much speculation. Some researchers believe it is because the spirit is emotionally attached to a given area. Other researchers believe it is beyond the spirit's control to change his or her parameters. A third group of researchers, and the group I now agree with, believe that the restriction is imposed to aid the spirit in clearing his or her amnesia. By keeping the spirit near all the clues the spirits will need to discover his or her own identity, the forces of the beyond are passively assisting the spirit down the path to the afterlife. This explanation seems to be the most plausible to this offer, and is consistent with my own observations. In the case, in the Lauren case, described in my book, Lauren and the Library, One Spirit's History, the spirit in question was linked to a library area in the house, and was cleared only after she apparently read her death records in the family Bible. Interestingly enough, although they were haunted in our time by a spirit who may have lived in the distant past, it is commonly believed the spirit itself may be only aware of the actual time period which surrounded their life on Earth. Again, relying on the reports of psychics, the spirits seem to be stuck in time as well as space, only able to transverse a small area. Being constrained in one movements or time would seem to be a miserable state. And it is my belief that every researcher has the responsibility to develop methods for freeing spirits from their anguish. To review the studies that have been performed on this issue. Alright, what ghosts see? The previous chapter, the previous ca chapter described where spirits live and alluded to what they may perhaps see. These comments notwithstanding, the topic of what spirits see is one of the most contentious areas in paranormal research. As far as the scientific community has been able to determine, spirits may have a very unique perspective on their surroundings. As stated in previous chapters, spirits seem to be suspended in time at the point surrounding their deaths. The bumps in the night, which are often reported as well, have irrational movements of objects which accompany poltergeist activity. Maybe nothing more than spirits inadvert inadvertently influence objects in our space and time while they relieve 
relive moments in theirs. Whether or not spirits can see living creatures is unknown. In some accounts, such as the often documented Lee hauntings, spirits seem to specifically target a family member for terrorizing. The Lee case certainly points to the need for caution in all attempts at documenting a haunting, and thankfully there was a positive healthy outcome for the researcher involved. Interesting to note that in many other accounts from psychics involving in house cleaning, spirits seem unaware of the living environment. The modern researcher therefore must take care to avoid unnecessary risks when investigating a reported haunting, as the risk to life is one not to be taken lightly. In several reports, psychics who have claimed to have channeled the deceased reports experience distortions in visual perception. They describe scenes that they attribute to the spirit as a sort of bizarre alternative reality which combines everyday objects with odd elements. Pasquale, 1985, posits that these distortions are the results of psychic intervention and may not exist for the spirit when the psychic is not present. This theory is difficult, if not impossible, to improve. <laughs> to prove. In closing, I wish to reiterate that paranormal research presents an enormous challenge to the researcher, for which many of us is the reason we participate in this area of study. Don't be discouraged if your first attempts at sighting spirits are unfruitful. Preserve, and your efforts will undoubtedly be rewarded. Happy hunting! Yeah, so that was a long one. In fact, that was so long I need to take another drink. But this is almost like the instruction manual for the game. It sort of lays out what we're going to be doing and what we're trying to accomplish and why things are going to work and sort of act the way they do. All right. Looks like we have almost like a clock here stopped at 9, 8.50, 7.50 maybe. Now the most interesting thing in here is actually over in this corner. And this is our bar. Now right now it's it's on set. So let's power it up. Now right now we have the level. We want to set the level to 6. We don't know what the gain is yet. But we are going to set the frequency mod to 8. Now if we try to run it, we get an error. So we're going to have to let it alone. Nice painting of a zebra, I guess. But now we can get a good look in this room. And right here, this is it. This is the amber device. Now it's hooked up to that little machine over here. Now you may remember we got an oscillator for our amber device here. So if I can get back to it, we are gonna put this oscillator in our amber device. All right, it's starting to charge up. And our peak has activated. The amber unit is online. Now the amber unit still needs a few more things done before it can be used. Let's keep exploring the house. Actually, over here by this desk. Alright, it's a little tough to read, but test settings, check breaker switch. I guess it says send specs for collector, check amber headgear. Run test in garage. All right, that's an important hint. All right, on the haunting edge, exploring life after death. Unorthodox scientist takes on the ultimate mystery. I think this is Andre Mercer. All right, Boston. At first glance, the office of Dr. Roxanne Westbridge Founder and CEO of Biosite Technology looks like any other high-tech office with tons of computer equipment and cables flowing around the room. However, on closer inspection, 
it is easy to see there is one big difference. Instead of developing hardware that crunches numbers or creates pretty pictures, Dr. Westbridge, or Roxy as her employees call her, is developing technology that she hopes will give us some answers about life after death. While it may seem unorthodox, this foray into the unknown is the latest step in a company history that has been filled with successful elex <laughs> eccentricity <laughs> eccentricities. Continue on page 3D. Well, we don't have page 3D. Alright, now over here in the dining room is some very important things. Oh, what was that? Some creepy noises going on. But we want to go over here. Because there is a taper, not a tape recorder, a video recorder, a camera. Now, there's nothing in there just yet, but we can change that. We open up the slide there, and we put the tape in. Now we can see what's on the tape. No, nope, you stay right where you are. And we're going to hit play. Now this is kind of a tiny little screen. Uh, I don't know if I'll leave it alone or if I'll edit it to be a bit bigger. But the important thing is to listen to what's being told. Let's see, it's day 12. We just had the last of the equipment moved over and even settled in a bit. It's starting to look like home. <laughs> Feels like it too. In fact, I think I would have bought this place even without its reputation. Anyway, I still have to set up the cameras and then I'll get back to the research. In a nutshell, nothing going on. Unpacking, catching up on reading. I'll use this log if anything interesting comes up. Out for now. Alright, so this is Roxy doing like a little video diary. Day 15. I've decided to name the new device Amber. That's an acronym for Astral Mobility by Electromagnetic Resonance. Unfortunately, other than naming the device, not much progress. No doubt about it, the psionic flow around here is strong enough. I can't blame the house, but something just isn't clicking. I can read the amplitude, but can't get the amber device to sync with my theta waves. Maybe if I link the bar into the network, I'll get a more stable signal. I don't know. Well, we saw the bar a little earlier. Day 20. And this place just isn't prepared for my electrical needs. Not surprising, given the drain I've imposed on it. Yesterday, when I was feeding a bar signal to the Amber device, the BT equipment went down. To make matters worse, the lights have been flickering on and off. It started when I restored the spare bedroom to wartime decor. I must have been right about one of the spirits being from the 40s, because all hell broke loose after I finished. That bedroom appears to be locked from the inside now, and I haven't found a way in yet. Oh, now we got some creepy stuff happening. Anyway, I've called an electrician about getting a second breaker and a backup generator installed. I can be damn sure this equipment doesn't go down while I'm astral. While he's here, I'll see if he can wire the property and some of the house lights to the new breaker. Hopefully that'll solve some of my problems. Yeah, that's a big hint. She's been overtaxing the power on the building. Day 24. I've tried, but things just aren't going right. The house has the activity that I need. I can't get the amber device to keep up with my theta. The computer driving the system definitely has the power, so I guess I'll just have to make these routines more efficient. I'm also having the guys from the lab send me a new oscillator. Maybe with that and getting the bar online, all this will finally come together. It took me a couple of days to figure out that I had an error in my original calculations, that I should set the bar gain to five to get the bar out. Once I get these routines pared down and each of the units online, I'll try Amber again. Hopefully that'll be soon. I'm convinced there's at least two spirits stuck here. They seem to want interaction, and I'm pretty sure I can get to them. It, it's just getting back that's unknown at this point. All right, so right there was the very important. doesn't get here soon, I'll make the most of the one I have. 
It was very important. We want to set the game to five. This is incredible. I've just detected an astral disturbance in the garage. The activity around here is peaking, so I'm afraid I may never get a chance like this again. As a result, I've decided to take this opportunity to test the Amber technology. Fortunately, I never got around to unpacking the garage, and the beater's in the shop again. As for my own safety, well, anything for fame and fortune, right? Anyway, maybe this will work, and maybe it won't. Either way, I'll find out what's behind the curtain. Foxy out. All right, so that was a lot of information that Roxy just d dropped in our lap. There, she thinks there's at least two spirits here. They've been messing around with the power. Well, or perhaps she's been messing around with it because she's taxing it too much. Now, do, 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 do. Uh, taking a quick look at my notes here, it says that Sandy Fix is the actress that played Roxy. Um, I just have her name. I don't know anything more about her than that. But she also decided to test this because there was a lot of activity happening, even though she wasn't fully prepared. The house hadn't been rewired to have more power, and she didn't get the oscillator for her amber unit. In fact, that's what she was wearing around her forehead. Now, we want to check out these cabinets. Wilt and Die, General Weed Killer. That's going to be important fairly soon. Just some glasses in there. But now that we know from her uh, testing what the gain should be, we're going to go back to the bar unit. And we've already got the level and the frequency set. Let's go to gain and set it to 5. All right, it's working now. So I'm pretty sure these numbers are always the same each playthrough, and our peak is reacting. All right, the bar is activated, and the cameras are online. So if we click on it, we can look at the cameras in each room. Now right now, there's not really anything going on, but if there's any activity detected, our peak will activate and show it to us. So through the dining room, there is a way into the kitchen. And see up there, one of the cameras. Yeah, wasn't there something about a bunch of beret berets ending up in the refrigerator? No, I don't think we get the chance to look at this refrigerator. While there is plenty to explore and poke around in the kitchen, there's not much actually to do. It's got peanut butter crispies. And she's got, I'm guessing that's happy peanut butter? Maybe hippie peanut butter? All right, and here's the back door. But there's a little something on the back door. Let's step outside real fast. Turn around and look at it. There's a little something attached to the doorknob here. And if we press this red button, it will turn off. And then we can take it. So I'm trying to remember the name of this device. The scan device is offline. You can, you can close now, it's okay. This little scan device can be put on different doorknobs, and if turned on, our little peak here will let us know if there's any residual energy. 
Okay, scan devices online. Total residue found. Time to process three minutes. I'm not quite sure if that's real time, but we've already heard what that one has to say. Now we can follow this path down to the boathouse, or we can go around back. And here's the garage. Now there's a little padlock there. The door handle doesn't work. We can, oh, our peak is acting up. Activity detected. What's going on? Um, what's happening in the house? Oh, the door's moving. The door is shaking. That was the same door we just put the scanning device on. Alright, so we know something happened in the garage. So, okay. We go here, the obvious way is the door. There's a little padlock. It makes perfect sense that maybe, you know, during the course of the game, we're going to find a key. We're going to find a key that will bring us uh, into the garage. We can look in the garage and see what's going on. Makes sense, right? That's not the case. And this has happened to me uh, <laughs> once while I was replaying the game so I could remember how to do everything. And it had to have happened to me the first time I was playing. What you actually just want to do is just come to this door and click on the top of it. And you just flip the garage door open. Alright, there's something very important in the garage. That's right, a crowbar. Now the garage appears to be empty. But there are stairs up to like a loft or something. What do we have up here? Well, look here. There she is. Roxy, are you okay? No, she's not okay. There's something very bad going on. And we don't know how to help her. At least not yet. So let's keep exploring. Can't get out that way. Oh, our peak is activating again. More activity, okay. Oh, what's going on in the dining room? Something's playing around. Oh, more than just playing around with a fork. They moved all those chairs around. Okay, let's get out of here. Oh, more activity on our peak. All right, play the tonal residue. Now we heard this one already. Yeah, so somebody was trying to get into the house. Somebody who did not sound happy. And that somebody may have been who was trying to force their way into the door. Actually, let's go around the long way. Just so you can kind of see some of the stuff. Alright, let's get our scanning device. Now, we can use this scanning device on almost every doorknob in the game. But not every doorknob in the game has a reaction. Alright, now this door leads us out to the hallway that leads up to the top floor. What? Oh. The, the game has decided to bring us up here regardless. So, Roxy mentioned that this door was locked. Yeah, see? We can't get it open. But we can do put the scanning device on it and activate it. We're already getting a response. Alright, it's going to take about five minutes to process. So this was a dark room, and it's the bathroom. Yep, toilet. We can flush it. As you always should. Now, what's going on in the shower? Oh, nothing. Just some soap and some shampoo. Oh. Join me. Ah. 
Yeah, a little creepy. I'm getting a response on our peak. Okay, yeah, this place is getting pretty active. Oh. Somebody got in the kitchen. And they went right for the knife. Not good. Now the join me uh, message is gone. So let's poke our heads around a little more up here. We got like an extra bedroom. It's got like some little wood figure over here. How about the drawers? Ah, her dream journal. <clears throat> Alright. 8 a.m. Last night I dreamt that a man showed me a new house. It's a lot bigger than the one I have now. I didn't like the house, but I liked the property. There were lots of flowers. The man came outside and became angry that I had gone outside. He screamed at me continuously for the rest of the dream. I hate having this kind of dream. Crying steadily in my sleep. Waking up exhausted. Another one from last night. Frank and I are on vacation together. He's been away on business or something. We are very happy at the beach. I think it was the ocean. Frank starts running and I run after him laughing. A car backfires somewhere. A plane flies overhead. The dream switches to a school party. I forgot my dress. Frank says he doesn't mind, and we dance. Tuesday night, 2.30 a.m. A lucid dream. Just like last time, the technique had worked. This time I was dreaming that I was in a race car, just me and some friends racing an old back road. I looked down while I drove and saw that I was wearing my new leather pants. Something clicked. Like the pants reminded me of my real life, and I realized I was in a dream. The colors got brighter. I felt such power. I knew I had control of the dream and that I could do anything. So I drove the car up in the air and all of us just flew for miles on end. It lasted like that for a few minutes, it seemed. And just as suddenly as, I, as it had started, I lost concentration and woke up. Oh, now the writing is getting a little sloppy. Second dream at a party. I know everyone. A little boy walks up and gives me a glass of water. Too sleepy to remember anything else. Thursday, 6 a.m. I was back in high school in my room, very bored and looking for something fun to do. I rolled my hair into a French twist with the ends sticking out at the top like a fountain. I get up and dance around laughing. Then I stop twirling. I see a man on a ladder looking in the window at me. He scares me. I scream and wake up. So I'm pretty sure those were Roxanne's uh, dreams, but they're kind of uh, informative about things that have been happening here. You got these weird vases. Nothing exciting in any of these drawers. How about over here in the closet? Up, oh, spooky robes. <laughs> uh, yeah, nothing in here. There is one more thing to look at. There's a TV in here. What's on the TV? Wait a second. That's the that's the the, the kitchen. And that's the hallway leading up to the stairs and. Oof. All right, so whatever that was, it knocked us on our ass. Time to get back up. More activity. All right, we got some tonal residue. Hmm. Kind of sounds like maybe someone calling for help and then maybe like a gunshot. All right. Let's 
get our scanning device back. So creepy things have been happening. No, we don't want to go in here yet. Don't want to go up the stairs either. I want to I want to get into the kitchen from here. I want to head back into the dining room through here. And oh, was that maybe a a look at who was ever trying to get into the house? Now that only happens if you enter this room through the kitchen. So far a lot of creepy stuff has been happening in this area of the house. Alright. Now what? Activity detected. Oh, that's back up in the bedroom. And that key just dropped in that drawer that was empty. We are definitely going to have to check that out. But first we're going to go down this path. There's our car still in the water. We're going to check out the boathouse. Now I purposefully wanted to try to leave the boathouse alone. until we got to this point. Now this is the only other place that there is any residue. Scan device online. Tonal residue found. Time to process three minutes. Now there are these uh, planks on the uh, boathouse. So let's see if we can pull them down. Yep. And let's... Maybe we can go in there. Uh, maybe not while the tonal device is scanning, so we'll let it alone for a minute. Now what we want to do is check the back of the house a little more. Because it's, you, you may not notice it the first time, but there's a path that goes up here. But it's blocked off. Blocked off by like all these overgrown weeds and plants. We have something for that. Fast acting. There's a path behind the house that leads up to a gazebo. And there is something here. So, as you walk around the gazebo, things will happen. But first, let's listen to our activity. Oh, they're getting aggressive in the living room. Slamming furniture around, picking it up. No activity. So, um, shadow going by. In fact, almost any time we move by the gazebo out here, there's going to be a shadow that moves with us. Yep, see, there it is again. No, we don't want to leave. This is one of the tough parts about the game. It can be a little hard to navigate the way you want. What if we go up into the gazebo? 
Well, our peak is acting up. But first, let's look around the gazebo. Oh, there's a shooting star going off in the distance. Alright, we got the tonal residue off the boathouse. Like a voice calling out for something. Now, I always thought the voice was saying something like Chansey. Or Chauncey, maybe. But I think it's actually Chippy. Alright, let's go reclaim our scanning device. No, we want to turn it off, not on. Let's try to go into the boathouse. Scanning process interrupted. Scan device offline. That's okay, we know that was happening. Does not appear to be much to look at. But now what if we turn and look towards the water? We can look down. And what's that? <laughs> yeah, some creepy ghost face screaming for help. Now... This is probably my fault. Normally you're supposed to turn and look at... Oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, laughing at us. Nearly ran us off the road. So yeah, I thought we almost missed that. But that, I think, is just about every creepy sighting that we can get. I think there's one more. Yeah, I think if we try to go upstairs. Yeah, something's waiting for us up there. Now what? More activity. Now, we have not seen that room before. The walls are bleeding. In fact, the walls are bleeding so bad they're flooding the room. Oh, what's that? You hear that? Phone's ringing. Somebody must want to talk to us. Hello? Hello? It's, it's me, Roxy. I can't hear you. Oh, but I can sense that you're there. I had to warn you. The Amber device, it's riddled with fragmentation errors. I thought I'd reached Astral, but I'm not sure anymore. I seem to be divided between several locations. Everything looks different. I must be drifting in and out of consciousness. I, I keep switching. Ted? Is that you? Who is this? Who is this? Are you there? Don't let anyone come after me. It's too dangerous. Besides, even if you could collect all the fragments, there's no guarantee the software could actually compile them. Thanks, and well, tell everyone else. Alright, so it seems like Roxy was able to contact us. Kind of let us know what's going on. 
Oh, more activity. The psionic wave detected. The headgear is activated. So that means we now go get our amber, our amber device, which has been properly configured and has the oscillator put in. There we go. And now you can see we have like these little straps to the left and right that lets us know we're wearing it. All right. Headgear modulating EEG flow to match current. One moment, please. Surf's up. All right, so now we can interact psionically with the spirits. All right, well, we have an idea where two of them are. There's one spirit up by that gazebo, and there was another spirit over by the um, boathouse. And because we have the headgear on, we're sort of like almost astral projecting. So we're going to hear things and see things that we probably wouldn't have otherwise. Now we saw a key get deposited. Sure enough, yeah, there is a key in there. And we came across, well, we came across two locked doors, technically. But it's really for this door. Alright, we unlocked it. And inside, well, it looks like a nice bedroom but there's light shimmering from that mirror. Well, things don't seem quite right. We can't even look away from the mirror. And into the mirror we go.